Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Human Trafficking, Ireland's Reality. My name is Janet Nutako, and I am a sister of the Congregation of Our Lady of Apostles. We are often simply known as OLAs. Mm -hmm. This webinar has been organized by the OLA and SME Justice Offices. Many of you have made a huge effort to join us today. On behalf of us all, we are deeply appreciative and offer you our most grateful welcome, culture to everybody. This evening, we will hear from Lisha Lee Vrian of the Rights Lab, University of Nottingham, as well as Anne Mara and JP O'Sullivan of MECPATS in conversation with the OLA Justice Officer, John Magidi. No. Every day, we wake up to the cry of suffering, pain, and justice. We hope this conversation will help all our viewers gain a greater understanding of the reality of human trafficking in Ireland, how and why it happens, and what we can all do to respond. Welcome, Lisha, Anne, and JP. And thank you for joining us this evening to share your wide knowledge. We would like to take this opportunity to congratulate JP and Anne on their recent awards. MECPATS received the Human Trafficking Social Justice Enterprise of the Year Award from the Irish Enterprise Awards 2021. Well done for your good works. Thank you. I'll begin with a brief presentation to outline what human trafficking is before hearing from our guest speakers. Once again, please keep your videos turned off and your microphones on mute. There are more people enslaved today than during the entire 400 years of the transatlantic slave trade. In 2020, the International Labour Organization estimated that more than 40 million people are enslaved through human trafficking today. The Palermo Protocol is a UN initiative to prevent, suppress, and punish trafficking of persons, especially women and children. It identifies human trafficking as the recruitment transportation, transfer, harboring, or reception of persons, including the exchange or transfer of control over those persons by means of threat or use of force, coercion, abduction, fraud, deception, abuse of power or position of vulnerability, giving or receiving of payments or benefits to achieve the consent of a person so as to having control over the other person for the purpose of, ex of exploitation. Exploitation shall include at a minimum the exploitation of another for prostitution or any other form of sexual exploitation forced labor or services, slavery or practices similar to slavery, servitude or the removal of organs. According to Renate, the Organization of Religious in Europe Networking Against Trafficking and Exploitation, trafficking comes in many forms, including forcing victims into prostitution, compelling victims to commit sex acts for the purpose of creating pornography, subjecting victims to slavery or involuntary servitude, and misleading victims into debt bondage. It is estimated that globally, 
80% of trafficking involves sexual exploitation and 19% involves labor exploitation. Nearly 70% of trafficked persons are female and many of them children. Human trafficking is the third largest international crime industry behind illegal drugs and arms trafficking. Estimates of the profits generated vary between 32 and $20 billion <coughs> every year. Around half of this is made in the developed world and trafficked victims or persons come from all age groups, many of them female and under the age of 18. Worldwide, only one to 2% of victims are rescued and only one in 10,000 Europeans involved in trafficking are convicted. Approximately 30 million children have lost their childhood through sexual exploitation over the past 30 years. Globally, the average cost of a slave is 120 euro. We hope that simple presentation provided us with a basic understanding of human trafficking. I now hand you over to the OLA Justice Officer, John Magidi, in conversation with JP, Anne, and Leisha. Please feel free to put your questions comments and ideas into the chat box. Over to you, John. Thank you very much, Sister Janet. Um, I hope everybody can hear me clearly enough. Um, welcome everybody, as Sister Janet said, and uh, thanks for joining us this evening. Um, and thanks, Janet, for going through that presentation, providing a, a basic outline of what human trafficking is and what it means. Um, as Sister Janet said, we'd invite everybody to um, put any questions they have or any comments they have into the chat box, and we'll try to address them towards the, the end of the conversation. Um, so that brings us to the conversation, and I'm delighted to welcome um, JP O'Sullivan and Anne Mara of MECPATS and Leisha Nivrian of the Rights Lab at um, the University of Nottingham. So uh, MECPATS is the Mercy Effort for Child Protection Against Trafficking uh, with the hospitality sector and services sectors. Uh, founded in 2013, MECPATS is the only non-profit organization in Ireland which works in direct partnership with the hospitality industry and services sectors to prevent child trafficking and to enhance existing protective measures. Anne Mara is the MECPATS Education Manager and JP O'Sullivan is the MECPATS Network and Communications Manager. Uh, the Rights Lab is a center of research established by the University of Nottingham, dedicated to providing long-term evidence-based strategies uh, to achieve the goal of ending slavery by 2030, as outlined in the UN Sustainable Development Goals, uh, target 8.7. The Rights Lab is home to the world's largest group of modern slavery researchers and many of the leading experts in modern day slavery and human trafficking. Leisha Nivrian uh, leads the Rights Lab's civil society engagement and impact. So thanks very much for joining us, JP, Anne and Leisha. So I suppose we'll get straight into it then. Um, and pose uh, a couple of questions to get to grips with what exactly is human trafficking um, and what we can learn uh, in order to better understand it and hopefully in order to be able to respond to it and, uh, and work against it. So I suppose the first question guys would be, um, you know, what is human trafficking? What's the full picture? Uh, apologies, I had my mic turned off as we were to uh, mute our things. 
Uh, thanks very much, everybody, uh, and for the very generous introduction. Um, so in relation to what it is, um, I think in the, in the piece that Sister Janet went through, she described the, uh, the definition in law, which is quite wordy and a bit uh, convoluted, I suppose. Um, it's composed of three central elements. Um, so there is to be an act, which is the recruitment, transport, harbour, those, those aspects in the, in the initial part of the definition. Um, a means, which is uh, how you achieve it, which is force, deception, abuse, power, those parts, uh, for a purpose. Um, and the purpose is exploitation. Um, this often comes in the form of labour exploitation, but doesn't necessarily need to be, and it doesn't necessarily need to be for money. Um, and as you saw in that presentation, the term trafficking and slavery were used somewhat interchangeably, which is very, very common in the sector. Um, the term trafficking is defined in, in that particular piece of law, um, and there are some misconceptions around it. Um, the word trafficking itself does seem to imply uh, that there needs to be some sort of a movement. Um, and there's a particular idea, I suppose, that there needs to be movement across an international border for it to be trafficking, but this is not the case. You can be trafficked within your own country and indeed, you know, within your, your hometown. Um, one of the acts that's mentioned in the definition is harbour, so it's that you're being, you're being kept somewhere. Excuse me. Um, and also, uh, there's, there can be a sense that a person's movement needs to be restricted. Um, and that, that, that's also a misconception. There could be a debt or a threat of violence, that means portion of the definition. And um, that means that the person doesn't move even if they do have apparent freedom to do so. Um, and then I suppose the other one is around, uh, people think that it's, hap it's something that happens in other countries, and, and back in time in history, of course, but it happens in other countries or to certain groups of people. Um, and this is also untrue. It can absolutely happen. There are, I mean, I work in the UK, as you can tell from my job, um, and the, the largest, the highest number uh, of nationals identified in their um, trafficking management system are British people and um, not people from anywhere else. Um, so while it can theoretically and does happen to anyone from anywhere, um, there are common characteristics around among the people who tend to be trafficked. And again, Sister Janet touched on, on some of these. Um, they tend to, people to tend to be people who are poor. Um, females are absolutely overrepresented. Um, uh, one, the, uh, there was a recent report which was able to distill it down to one in every 130 females in the world are impacted by this. Um, and it tends to be largely people from kind of marginalised social groups. So this can be people from kind of poorer classes or marginalised castes, and in certain places um, it can be associated with religion. Increasingly, you're seeing that there's more migrants involved um, as, as migration is, is increasing globally. Um, so it could be unregulated migrants, but not necessarily. Um, as the impacts of climate change are felt more strongly, this is anticipated to increase as these groups that I've described are also the ones who are more likely to be impacted by climate change. So I suppose centrally it's about an abuse of power based on those characteristics um, and it ultimately leads to significant exploitation of the individuals involved and the denial of their, excuse me, their human rights and, and their basic dignity. Um, JP or Anne want to add to that? Um, I found that statistic um, quite starkly, and I guess every day is a school day about the one in 130 women. Um, you know, when we're talking here in Ireland, and I think the, the laws are quite different to what's being um, explored and experienced in the UK, and specifically around children. And one of the, the great challenges that we are facing in, in Ireland um, is while the laws are very robust, there's outstanding laws in place, and there's huge penalties if somebody's identified as being a trafficker of other persons. But really, it's bringing back down to the basics of, as you said, you know, what is human trafficking, what is child trafficking, and conversations that are certainly not opening up here as they are in the UK around um, the recruitment of children for the purpose of criminal exploitation. Now, quite recently, um, only in the last number of weeks, a piece of legislation was introduced to protect this vulnerable pocket of children. Yet 
that cohort or the, that group of young persons are still not being referred to as victims of child trafficking. Um, and I was just wondering, I suppose, in the UK, because you're so far ahead in terms of recognising um, the trafficking of children across county lines, um, if there's anything we could learn from what you're um, experiencing or identifying um, through the Rights Lab. Um, the UK is actually not my particular area of focus uh, of work at all. Um, I generally tend to work on more international cases. And um, so projects that I work on okay. at the minute are in India, Nigeria, Uganda, that type of thing. So can I, I reframe the question for you? <laughs> Absolutely, please. Um, in terms of your, your, I suppose, understanding of where Ireland is at, mm -hmm. how poorly are we performing in relation to countries like India? Are we on a par? Are we ahead? Are we behind? What's your opinion? Uh, that's that's a very difficult question because uh, I do think they're always multifaceted. I suppose there would be a lot of elements in Ireland, a lot of social protection elements in Ireland that wouldn't exist somewhere like India that inherently are protective in relation to different things. So it would kind of put things in one way. Mm. I think I think a point you touched on um, that applies absolutely to the Indian context. And I, I'm trying to think of, I don't imagine that there is a context where it isn't the case is the existence of laws is only one small part of it. Mm -hmm. um, it's about the implementation of those laws and it's about the meaningful implementation of those laws. Um, uh, again, referring back to uh, Sister Janet's uh, presentation, clearly going to be a touchstone for me for the evening. <laughs> um, those tiny numbers of people that are actually end up kind of convicted for anything or done for anything is, mm -hmm. is absolutely tiny numbers. Um, so th there are very good laws that exist in a number of different countries, but the implementation of them is incredibly poor. Mm -hmm. And Ireland, the UK, India, none of those countries are any exceptions to that. Um, what I might point to, maybe of interest to the audience, is um, one of, in, in the Rights Lab, the work is structured over, excuse me, five different research programs, one of which is law and policy. Um, and the, the head of the law and policy prog program did an analysis of all of the laws in all of the countries in relation to the different, uh, in, in relation to their implementation of the different laws uh, of related to trafficking that exist. Um, and while slavery is technically legal, illegal in every country, um, the, the, it's only actually, there are only laws in place in about half of the countries in the world that actually criminalize the ownership of another human being. So I suppose it's about, uh, so there's a, a whole database that analyzes, like I say, all these countries, the, 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 what their laws state at the moment. That's not even the implementation part of it. And the gaps are far bigger than we had realized. So I think there's a huge amount of work to be done everywhere on it. But I do think you're right to look to different examples around the world of who is doing what components well and try to do those better. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Lucia. And just uh, to come in there, uh, Leisha and, and JP, like, I mean, you're touching there on, obviously, you know, the definitions of slavery and, and how it's happening and where it's happening. And, um, you know, it's really interesting to get that insight into <clears throat> what's happening, for example, in India. Um, but like, just to bring it back for a moment to the Irish context, mm -hmm. um, you know, are you able to speak a little bit about, um, you know, what's happening here? Um, and I'm sure we probably have some people uh, in the audience here who are outside Ireland, and I'd like to actually come back to that question afterwards about the global connections. But um, maybe if you speak a little bit about that for a moment, you know, how does it work um, in Ireland? I can take that question, John. Good evening, everybody. Um, the reality of human trafficking in Ireland um, is very hard to see. And we often have used the expression in the whole anti-human trafficking area of victims of trafficking being hidden in plain sight. And really that's the reality of it in this country. There are victims of human trafficking under our very noses. And just to paint a picture of the information we have about the victims that have been identified by Angarda Siakana, and we get our statistics which have been compiled by the Department of Justice so looking at the last six years of statistics that we have, we see that 88% of all victims identified in Ireland are women and girls. Also 21% of those victims are children. 
and we would classify a child as anybody under the age of 18. Um, the victims come from many different places, but most, um, mostly from Nigeria, Brazil, Pakistan, Indonesia. Um, but there are Irish national victims also, and it's important not to lose sight of the fact that what Leisha mentioned at the beginning, a victim does not have to be moved or brought across a border for it to constitute a case of trafficking. So there are Irish vi uh, victims. Now the statistics that we have don't paint a very real picture because unfortunately victim identification in this country is quite mm -hmm. poor and challenging. And maybe JP can speak to that in a little bit. But the crime of human trafficking was first made a criminal offence back in 2008 in Ireland. And since then, we have had absolutely zero prosecutions to date for the crime. Um, victims of human trafficking have been identified in various different industries and sectors across the country, but um, some of them would include domestic work, the fishing industry, seasonal agricultural work, waste management, um, um, nail bars and car washes, just to give um, an example. And then obviously um, the greatest um, mm -hmm type of exploitation that can be found in Ireland is sexual exploitation. And that's followed by labor exploitation and then forced criminality. So I hope that gives you a little flavor of what types of trends we're seeing in Ireland. Like that's, a, that's literally extraordinary. And that um, we're in a situation where there have been zero convictions since yes since uh, uh, 2013, like that doesn't make any sense. Um, and given the numbers, like they're identifying, well, and as you said though, victim event identification is poor in Ireland as well. Um, so obviously, I mean, you're gonna have fewer prosecutions, but even of those cases that have been identified, the fact that there are no convictions, you know, I think baffling. Well, um, part of the reason, part of the reason for that is because it's incredibly difficult to um, investigate um, a case of human trafficking, and the Gardaí would say they are completely reliant on the victim's testimony. And as you can imagine, victims of human trafficking have been through abhorrent situations with the most um, awful awful experiences and at the point of their identification they are given a choice they either stay and they're given a 60-day reflection period to decide whether they want to um, provide testimony go to court and help the Gardaí build a case against the trafficker. And during that time, they do get access to state services, including legal aid and accommodation. However, most of these victims are completely and utterly devastated. And so um, uh, the, the other choice for them is to be repatriated back to their home country if they have been trafficked from abroad. And as you can imagine, most of those victims would choose repatriation over staying and testifying against their trafficker. And that's one of the reasons why prosecution is so challenging. And like, I mean, <clears throat> just like that idea that somebody who's been so traumatized and who has been, you know, living under an, an atmosphere of coercion for so long to expect that person to be able to now just step out into the light and you know, deal with the guards as if, you know, it's been no problem. But there's also a disturbing element there of, I mean, obviously, if people want to be repatriated, it's, it's important that we provide that service. But there is a, a kind of a bit of a disturbing sense of deporting your problem. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure if you have any thoughts on that, but... I think the intention is, is not to re-traumatize the victim mm. in any way, shape or form and to respond to their request but it does make it very challenging for the guard mm -hmm. to try and, you know, pursue a prosecution. And then I suppose just maybe if Leisha wants to come back on that, like 
in terms of how that fits in then with the experience in other countries and I suppose the global context and um, maybe could you speak a, mo- a little bit to that? Absolutely yeah um, I I don't again I don't know the context where practically excuse me every word that Anne just said isn't entirely applicable as well and um, victim identification being poor I mean one of the things that we try to do at the Rice Lab is uh, work on prevalence and we've come up with I say we, I had no part in this very, very clever and complicated work, um, is around uh, prevalence estimates. Um, and it's incredibly complicated. Um, first of all, you're talking about, you know, something that's highly illegal. Um, so there's a lot of kind of clandestine efforts to liberty to obfuscate it. Um, and because you're, in a lot of cases, it's not always the case, not by a long shot, but there's very... There are a, lar- a number of large, very organized crime gangs involved in this, um, and they have learned over the years from whether they traffic in arms or other things as well, drugs, um, how to evade the law. Um, in relation to impunity, um, yeah, so again, two points on that. The difficulty in convicting under a trafficking law is really, really high. Um, sometimes there are other... Um, kind of associated laws, maybe something around kind of kidnapping or restricting freedom, those kinds of ones. And um, in a number of countries, they will tend to go for the slightly easier law in order to ensure a conviction. But then you don't have convictions against trafficking and these um, other crimes obviously carry lighter sentences. Um, One thing that I will say in kind of some reference to kind of things like the Me Too movement, females need to be believed and taken more seriously female testimony is not taken with the level of seriousness that it should be, and crimes against females are not taken with the level of seriousness that it should be. Um, And again, then to refer back to uh, the aspect of having a victim-centred approach, it's um, where did the current processes come from? Who was involved in constructing those? In the last couple of years, you've found that there's much more involvement of survivors um, as sector leaders there's a lot more survivor-led movement. Um, and I think their involvement is absolutely critical in relation to shifting processes so that they are more victim-centered and that the process, processes are designed to be trauma-informed and trauma-responsive so that all of those processes are just better for the survivor and the person coming through them. Um, just to say in relation to the predominance of um, sex work being the, or prostitution being the, the type of exploitation, um, this can be another, uh, on account of another preconception about trafficking. Um, it is, I'm not trying to suggest for a second that it's not absolutely predominant worldwide, it is. But um, particularly if you go back probably maybe about 10 years across Europe, and um, the idea of forced labour or males being trafficked it, it just wasn't really understood. So, and, and again, kind of as Anne says, hidden in plain sight, you can see a lot of that. And it's just, you see it, it's maybe it's migrants that are working hard. You see that there's maybe temporary accommodation put in place. Um, but there can be an awful lot of coercion um, and force involved in that. People might be withholding documents. People might be retaining their pay. Excuse me, a number of different elements around that. Um, in Ireland, in relation to the fishing industry that uh, Anne mentioned, there have been a number of changes, some of them global and some of them particular to Ireland, which have made that one of the most um, exploitative um, systems or, or sectors in the country. Um, there's not as many young people going into fishing now. Um, so between that, there's been consolidation of the sector and then on account of stocks declining, there's been quotas put in place and a number of different factors that mean it's just not as attractive a, a proposition as it had been. So you, so migrants are brought in and when migrants are involved, they don't um, necessarily speak the language or they're not familiar with you know, their rights and different aspects uh, and on account of the fact that fishing takes place in the sea and um, the, the whole sector, um, there, there's a lot of scope for exploitation within that. Um, in relation to domestic servitude, um, in domestic servitude is the sector within which there is the highest rate of forced labour in the world. And um, so of all of them, if you look in brick kilns, 
making, if you look in agriculture, construction, anything. So domestic servitude is, is the one where it's the highest rates of forced labor. Um, one is, the, and then the feminization of that is considerable. 80% of those in domestic servitude are women. So that represents one in every 25 female wage workers in the world. Um, and if you look, go to kind of a regional focus, somewhere like Latin America, that's one in every four women who earn a wage or do so as a domestic worker. Um, other aspects there then in relation to uh, trafficking for forced criminality and um, cannabis grow houses and, and other uh, um, elements like uh, JP mentioned, um, moving across county lines for drug running. And um, that's an issue in Ireland, in the UK, across Europe. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I suppose there's an aspect involved there in relation to ensuring that police uh, and other first responders are trained and understand and recognise what they encounter when they come across this, that it's not um, that the people who are actually victims and who have been trafficked are not um, tried and prosecuted as criminals, which has been the case both in the UK and in Ireland. Um, then I, I mean, there's, there's such an array of different um, elements. Um, in the most recent ILO statistics, uh, for the first time, they included forced marriage um, with um, forced labour as a form of modern slavery. Um, and again, this is very, very high. 80% are female and an estimated 15 million worldwide. Issues related to climate change and migration and things like the current pandemic are likely to make that worse um, as poorer families or families that, need, that weren't necessarily even poor but that need to migrate. Um, they resort to what are called uh, negative or detrimental coping strategies. So they will tend to marry off girls at a younger age um, for their own protection and to, to secure their futures, which obviously is, is, is not ideal. Um, and then, like I say, there are the sectors such as garment production, brick kilns, um, organ harvesting is, is, is gaining more, um, well, it, it's becoming a bit more common. Um, and even things such as um, sports, people being trafficked for sports. Um, when I came across this first, I thought it was, I don't know, to do with garment production or the production of sporting equipment. But it's literally youngsters, excuse me, being trafficked from West Africa in particular into Europe. Um, in football clubs, soccer is the, the one that I would have come across uh, a couple of times um, for the, the wages that they can earn as young footballers. Um, and again, their, um, their wages are kept and their documents are retained and, and different things. Um, it's been, there's been a particular uh, issue with it on account of COVID um, because a number had moved to different countries in Europe um, and then they've just basically kind of been abandoned wherever they were when COVID hit and training had to stop and that kind of thing. Um, and I suppose one other one that we're all exposed to to greater or lesser extent is around the mining for precious metals. So we're all sitting here connected on our, our mobile phones and our laptops and devices as well. So kind of call time production and, and other such minerals. Like, I mean, that's such a wide diversity of, of sectors. Um, like you'd almost sort of uh, be overwhelmed at the idea of it and you, you, know, you really question how, how do you even respond to that and um, given it is spread over so many factors um, and I suppose that poses the question how, how are we responding like I mean j just to, to bring it back just to the Irish context like what are we doing in Ireland and um, what's 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 the Irish state doing to effectively respond to trafficking? Um, and that's a very good question, John. Um, what is the state doing? Um, I think to start with how the international um, community sees how Ireland is doing is we've had reports from the OSCE who clearly stated um, that Ireland is not screening for victims of child trafficking in particular. We've had reports from Europol, we've had reports from Interpol um, all again, reflecting back on the, the statistics Anne shared with us, um, the numbers that are published annually by the Department of Justice, um, the international reports are saying that's a very small percentage of the reality, the actuality on the ground in Ireland. 
most recently, um, we had a report from the US State Department and their annual tips report that has moved Ireland um, from what's referred to as the tier one um, within their report. So a tier one is a country that knows they have a problem and are responding sufficiently well to that challenge in front of them. A tier two is a country that knows they have a problem and aren't doing quite enough. A tier three country is a country that knows they have a problem and are doing zero um, about it. So Ireland up until 2021 sat on a tier two. We've now been moved to a tier two watch list. We're the only country in Western Europe on that watch list. So that's what the international um, communities are saying we're doing, um, very little. We're not doing enough. Um, we have more resources available to us than we're actually putting into the, um, solving the problem or even addressing the problem. Um, what's happening internally in Ireland is um, we have a number of very strong um, services that are standing independently from each other. Um, the joined up thinking is quite simply not happening. We have a national referral mechanism in Ireland. <clears throat> So in order for somebody to be identified as being a victim of trafficking, they have to come into contact with what's referred to as the National Referral Mechanism. The center of that NRM are on Garda Síochána. So today in Ireland, you can only be identified as a victim of trafficking officially by a member of Angarda Síochána. Angarda Síochána themselves would say that they're not adequately or sufficiently trained to be able to carry out that role um, successfully because they carry the role of identifying the victim, but also carry out the role of investigating. So they're not able to do both. So we're hopeful that in 2021, that national referral mechanism will be almost unpicked and rebuilt. And hopefully it will be restructured with professionals that are at the front line, that are coming into contact with victims of trafficking, that are coming into contact with vulnerable children and vulnerable adults, because you know, we have a campaign here in Ireland that's run by our government and it's called the Blue Blindfold Campaign. It's called Do Don't Close Your Eyes to Human Trafficking. But I think we need to step back. I think we need to open our eyes in the country first because it's very difficult to be identified as a victim of trafficking if there's nobody looking for you mm -hmm. and nobody who knows what you look like. So what's the country doing? We're, to be quite honest, we're not doing our best. We're not doing as much as we could. I think the international um, reports shine a spotlight on us. I do think that spotlight carries a bit of a, a bit of a timeline. Um, the spotlight can shine to another country very quickly. Mm -hmm. So that's what what's important about I think conversations like what's happening here this evening, that we are all part of the conversation, um, that we can all do something. Um, and I know we're going to talk about that later. Um, but the the government at present is quite simply not responding efficiently well to the to the potential um, victim supports that are that are needed. And I'd probably just add a couple of things to highlight in terms of Ireland's response to the issue of human trafficking. One would be around child victims of trafficking in particular, and that's what MECPAT's focus is on. Um, if a child is identified as a victim of trafficking in this country, they are um, referred to TUSLA and TUSLA then assume the responsibility of care for that child. But at present, um, a, a student can go through five years of study to become a registered social worker in this country and never hear the words human trafficking. And so we have our frontline professionals, including those with the main responsibility for care of children and, and victims of trafficking who don't know anything about the subject and therefore cannot effectively provide the services that these children require. The other thing I would highlight um, as being a shortfall is um, that reflection period that uh, victims uh, receive when they are deciding whether to um, go forward with a prosecution or not. The accommodation that is provided to them by the state is direct provision accommodation. So you can have, for example, a female victim of sexual exploitation being identified as a victim of trafficking and then placed in 
a direct provision center, sometimes having to share a bedroom with three other women. It is wholly unacceptable that that would happen. And I know the Department of Justice are in consultation and, and hopefully yeah. about a better, <laughs> a better solution for, um, for those victims. But those two issues I would highlight as being incredibly important and where we need change fast. Absolutely. And and I think we've we've heard evidence as well of um, victims of human trafficking being accommodated in direct provision and they actually coming back into contact with the persons responsible for their own traffic trafficking who are also within the same accommodation centers. So I agree wholeheartedly with that and I think it's it's inappropriate accommodation. And somebody mentioned earlier about the re-traumatization of the victim. That's what's being facilitated in, in Ireland right now. And I mean, like, you know, we're in a position now where, where the government has pledged to get, it's, a, it's acknowledged that direct provision is not fit for, for any purpose. I mean, the idea that people who are suffering, who have suffered such trauma would be just placed in there. Um, and the idea that, as you said, Anne, that people can be, you know, going through their, their entire course of study for, for as uh, a social work and not um, and not be trained up in this. And, and I know that JP, like your, your background is, is as a social worker, like, mm -hmm. um, I mean, what's going on there? Is that simply that, how does something like this not end up on the curriculum? Um, quite simply, John, I think it's part of the, the bigger non-conversation that's happening in Ireland. Um, you know, it's, I suppose it's a very simplistic way to put it, but I think it maybe reflects where we are in, in Ireland. You know, if you identify that there's a problem mm -hmm. in a country, in a business, in a community, whatever um, setting it is, you have to do something about it. To be able to do something or to do something about it, you either have to spend money mm -hmm. or you have to get the resources from elsewhere. To get the resources from elsewhere, it comes back to a financial will as well. And I think we saw last year within government spending, there was an underspend of a couple of hundred thousand that was set aside for anti-human trafficking work. And it just went back into the general pot. So the expertise perhaps isn't there to know how to tackle it efficiently, um, mm -hmm. efficiently well. Um, so I think that's why it's not sitting on curriculums because nobody's having the conversation. People don't want to have the conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, like many other things um, over the, the course of time in Ireland. But um, that's where we're at, and specifically within social work. I know myself having um, studied in there, it just didn't appear, as Anne said, on any curriculum, which is very unusual because, I mean, it's both a child protection and a child safeguarding issue. Yeah. If I can I mean, just add a little to that, sorry, Dan. Um, yeah, sorry, um, in, in addition to training the next generation, I mean, if it's a responsibility of the individuals in Tusla, then there needs to be training provided throughout TUSA. It's not just a case of waiting for the current cohort that are in, you know, third level studies to come Absolutely. through and for it to filter through. There needs to be dedicated training provided to any organization who are identified or any entity that are identified as first responders, if that's medical professionals, teachers. You cannot just simply say TUSA are responsible for child protection this is a child protection issue. This is just a whole swathe of an area. There are uh, so many things that are so specific to this. They are very, very closely related, but they are so specific to this and a lack of un appropriate and nuanced understanding of them will just mean that people who have already suffered more than enough are being let down time and again. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Alicia. And, you know, we've been or MECPATS has been attempting to have these conversations over the past number of years with those frontline professionals. And really, it's only in the last probably six months that those calls have been returned, those conversations have been sort of picked up by social workers. They've been coming back to us and saying, you know what, we've been seeing things within child protection social work. We didn't know what to call them. They weren't abuse and they weren't a form of exploitation. We think it was trafficking, but we didn't know what yeah. we were looking at. So we were very pleased there recently to be in a meeting at Maynooth University um, and there was an international protection officer there from Tuzla and they have just initiated a conversation about training the existing frontline professionals under continuous professional development mm -hmm. and that's I guess where MECPATS are hoping to slide in over the next 12 months. We've extended the offer to Tuzla 
Um, and they've come back and they said, yes, we do want to work with you. We're not quite sure what we want yet. Um, so we're kind of sitting in the doorway waiting for the, the knock to come again. But alongside social workers, Leash, you're, you're right. Anybody that comes into contact with a vulnerable person should be adequately trained, both for the, the person themselves' um, well-being and for, for that victim standing in front of them. And I'd just like to say that is in no way, shape or form a criticism of Tusla. It is, do you know what I mean? I fully appreciate yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the constraints that they operate with, within. They, they, I know so many people who are already absolutely overstretched in the work that they do. It is not their mm. responsibility to um, seek this out. It is the responsibility of the government to ensure that the professionals that are undertaking these tasks have the training that they require. Absolutely. And I suppose just then, like, you know, as happens all the time, it appears to be that whenever the government abdicates its responsibility um, to deal with these issues uh, and it refuses to resource um, the services required, like that's where all too often civil society organizations need to step in. And like, I suppose just to ask, you know, what are your organizations, you know, just to give our audience a bit of a better understanding, maybe what are your organizations doing to sort of step in, to step into that vacuum effectively? Well, I go ahead. Oh yeah, yeah no, go, go on. Go ahead, and go ahead. And you're fine. <laughs> um, I'm. I, I see so many familiar faces on the screen, so I'm sure this isn't news to to everybody. But um, Mechpats was founded back in 2013 by two sisters of mercy, Mary Ryan and Patricia O'Donovan, and they were attending a United Nations um, meeting on the status of women. And there was a lot of talk about human trafficking and the plight of women within that. And um, when they returned to Ireland, they they recognised there was a there was a gaping hole um, in terms of um, working with the hospitality industry in particular to train up their staff because we know that hospitality staff are amongst those frontline professionals most likely to encounter a victim of trafficking. And so they set it up in 2013 and myself and JP have been with the project for the last three years. And it has branched in many different more areas and is growing all the time. But our main focus is to educate and advocate for child protection against trafficking for exploitation. And the more people we can train and educate, the better, because it will help in opening people's eyes to, um, to what's really there in reality. Mm -hmm. Alicia. Thanks, Anne. Um, I suppose John kind of synopsized it in the introduction. Um, the Rice Lab is, is a research unit associated with the university. Um, so they, um, they're, role is to develop um, the evidence base to support organizations like MECPAS and to help to guide kind of government decisions. Um, we work across the world. Um, as I mentioned, we have five research programs. Um, the one I'm most closely related to is the Communities and Societies program, which looks at what can be done at that kind of community level, excuse me, in relation to um, responses. Um, uh, then there's the law and policy program that I referred to earlier, where they looked at the different kind of legal um, situations in different countries. And then they also do, like JP referred to the NRM, the National Referral Mechanism. So one project that we've got at the moment is that they're doing a review of national referral mechanisms around the world and identifying different strengths um, in different contexts, different types of national referral mechanisms that exist and the, the relative strengths and weaknesses of those so they can publish um, kind of guidance materials to aid uh, appropriate decision making. There's a, a business and economy program um, and that looks at kind of global supply chains. So uh, there's a lot of, I suppose, talk and pressure put on consumers these days in relation to their choices to, you know, mm -hmm. to, to help end slavery. I, have to say I see red every time I hear that I'm no no there are governments there are laws in place people are entitled to walk into a shop and feel that they can pick something up and that they're not supporting slavery it does make me laugh when I see these kind of you have an ethical section in in like maybe a clothes shop and I'm kind of going so that means everything else in here is unethical 
label it that way and you might find your ethical sales increase. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, that's my, my particular tangent, I'm not a fan. <laughs> Um, then there is uh, environment and ecosystem. Um, I, I mentioned a couple of times the, uh, the association and the linkages between environmental degradation um, and um, increases in, in, in trafficking and, uh, and slavery. Um, and then finally, there's one on data and measurement that kind of cuts across all of the other programs. Um, and it's about how to understand the data that we've got. And it's looking at a number of really innovative ways to kind of combine very large data sets to, to identify different trends and understanding that you humans wouldn't be able to identify themselves. Again, very technical, not my area. <laughs> um, and within that project, then there's, um, they're also using Earth observation or satellite imagery to see what else can be learned from that kind of bird's eye view. So, for example, if you've got clearances in very thick jungle, and so um, in somewhere like the, the Sundarbans in Bangladesh, there are fish drying farms, which the very thick jungle means it's very difficult to identify where they are. Obviously, a satellite imagery of a particular area, you'll be able to identify it. And it's just held, it's not the point at any individual place and say exploitation is happening there. But it does, what it does do is it helps civil society and governments direct their resources to where different mm. elements seem mm -hmm. to indicate or a set of elements that are associated with exploitation might happen to exist. Sometimes they go and check and it's absolutely kosher and everything is fine, but that's fine. Um, but I suppose um, one of the things that I was very uh, pleased to see, I've been working in this field for yeah. close to 10 years um, from the NGO perspective. Um, and when I saw the role that I currently hold, um, it was specifically to connect the researchers with civil society. My role is basically to make sure that the research that's been undertaken is informed by the experience of those um, working kind of um, in practitioners who are working with civil society organizations so that it's not a set of academics sitting somewhere, you know, in academic theory land and um, thinking that they know what's best for the sector. It's absolutely being really engaged and it's also recognizing the constraints that people in civil society organizations work under in relation to time and resources, those things, and providing um, a conduit through which I can take that research and pass mm -hmm. it to the people who might be able to, to, to make use of it. So that's why the, the um, uh, civil society engagement and impact is the impact part of it. Um, so, yeah, I, I thought that was quite foresighted of them, and I was pleased to see that they had that role. And obviously, then very pleased to see them who got it. <laughs> yeah. And like, I think that's, as I said, like really important that, because I think that the, the theme that's coming through this evening, listening to this conversation, is, you know, the fact that society and the state need to not just cl not close their eyes, but actually need to open up and realize the problem and actually begin responding to it. And of course, there's a need to, to be able to, to integrate research with civil society and, and with agencies so that so that, that it, it's actually put into practice and it's and it's effective um and i suppose like on that question of you know opening our eyes and trying to be more effective um like and i suppose this for the three of you what um you know for our audience now here this evening you know what do they need to be doing mm -hmm. um or what can they do um so I suppose I'll start with that one, John. I suppose there are practical things that people can do every day and there are organizations that they can engage with. Um, MECPATS is a very proud member of Cork Against Human Trafficking and Cork Against Human Trafficking is a collective of um, actors from the world of um, anti-human trafficking in Ireland. Um, so we have the, the HSE are represented Tusla. Um, MECPATS is there, we've got the Worlds of Academia linking that research again back to civil society. Um, but we've got a group of people that get out and campaign on the streets when we're allowed to or when we can again. We did it very effectively before um, the pandemic. Um, in terms of each individual, I think the, the greatest learning is knowing what to look out for, um, how you could be in a position to identify a victim of trafficking. Um, there is a really concise um, piece of um, learning available on the Cork Against Human Trafficking website that can be downloaded. I think it's called What Are You Looking For or What Are You Looking At? And it gives indicators. 
Um, and there are things that we would use in our everyday work in MECPATS as well with the hospitality and services sectors, showing people what to look out for. Um, and the most important part, I think, is, you know, how to report it. Um, so what people could do is very practical piece of work. Um, I think traditional ways of lobbying governments, lobbying local representatives is always very effective. Um, so while technology moves ahead, moves ahead in leaps and bounds, the, the importance of that physical letter that lands on your TD's desk, um, I think that can't be um, undersold. It's hugely, hugely important. Um, and myself and Anne are very proud that I think Mercy is one of the largest lobbying groups in Ireland. Um, so we carried that, that strength behind us as well. Um, so that's what I suppose, from my perspective, um, people can do. There are websites that people can visit as well. Um, so mechpats.com, um, the IOM's website is very good. Um, the Migrants Rights Centre of Ireland website is quite good. Cork Against Human Trafficking's website, that's sextrafficking.ie, um, is a really good, concise um, source or resource. Um, I think most people would have come in contact with the work of Ruhama as well. So maybe you have a look at their website. And um, so everybody brings something uh, different and unique to the table. There's great learning in everybody's materials. Um, and the Blue Blindfold website, um, the government's web own website has links out to all of those organizations to learn more. Um, I would add, it, you know, I do think it is incumbent upon all of us to research and to know a little bit more about the topic and also to familiarize ourselves with um, the potential indicators or signs to look out for. And whilst you'll look at the indicators, they are essentially common sense. And what myself and JP would always say in our trainings that um, if there are those red flags or those indicators present, but really you have a gut feeling that something just isn't right, then we would really encourage you to report. And that reporting can be made um, directly to Angar the Shiakana. They have a specific human trafficking investigation and coordination unit set up specifically to investigate suspicious activities around human trafficking. Um, and there are three ways in which you can do that. If it is an emergency situation, obviously you call 999. Um, you can also pick up the phone to your local Garda station and run it by the, the guard on duty to see what he says, um, he or she says. And then thirdly, you can report anonymously so you can call the Garda Confidential Hotline on 1-800-666-1 or you can email blueblindfold at garda.ie. So it's, there's a very specific way you can report your suspicions and you will know and you can be confident that the Garda will address those concerns. And do you wanna Anne, give that number and that um, email address again? Yeah, it's um, 1-800-666-1, which is the Garda Confidential Hotline, or you can email blueblindfold at garda.ie. Thanks, Anne. And all that reporting information is on our website and is on many of the other websites as well. Absolutely. And I suppose I'm conscious of time here and we're probably going to need to need to, to, to wrap up. But what I would like to do is maybe um, bring in some of the questions because I know a lot of questions were coming in. We might try to answer as many of them as we can. Um, uh, j just before doing that, though, if I might just ask, it just JP mentioned the power of the letter and advocacy. And if you were um, you, the three of you to, to recommend anything in particular that people might include in a letter of advocacy, you know, what, what would be sort of on the top of your list? I'm putting you on the spot now because <laughs> there's so much to cover as you've already, as you, you've already explained, it's so, so comprehensive. It's a very long list, John. Um, I think for me, um, because of the nature of the work of MECPATS, it would be a cross-departmental conversation between the Department of Children and the Department of Justice, and um, that they both recognize that they have a responsibility um, both to protect and also to prevent the trafficking of children. Um, so that would be my, my Christmas list for 2021. Great, thanks. 
So um, what I might just now, and again, we really are getting close to time, but if I could just invite um, Jerry Ford, the SMA Justice Officer, um, to, to join us. Jerry has been watching the chat box and watching questions and comments coming in. Um, so Jerry, are there any kind of key questions jumping out at you in the chat box um, that maybe haven't already been covered? Um, that maybe um, Leisha or Anne or JP could, could respond to? Yeah, yeah, there are a few. Um, one question we were asked is, are there safe homes for victims in Ireland? Maybe I'll answer that. Uh, that no. used, yeah, that, well, th there used to be safe homes, and I know uh, some of them were run by our colleagues, um, especially Sister Mary Ryan. Um, but um, they uh, they have since been disbanded, and victims there then are now placed in um, direct provision. Adult victims are placed in direct provision, and that's state determined or state led. Okay. Um, is Ireland in denial about human trafficking? Are we not doing enough to highlight this awful, terrible atrocity in our country and our world, especially as it affects our most vulnerable and those who are on the edges of our societies? I don't think civil society is in denial. Um, I don't think the wider population is necessarily in the know to have a concern. Um, I do think that the government responses are ineffective for the scale of the problem that's set out uh, in front of us. Um, so denial, repackaged maybe. Okay. okay. And um, can trafficking victims be family members or acquaintances of the people, children being trafficked? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, it's, and it is very often the case that it is somebody who is known to the family and can be a family member as well. Absolutely. Okay. And a question that came in pretty early. Um, what can we Irish do to boycott slave traders? And this was connected to another two questions. And it was, can Irish people be punished by Irish law for supporting the slave trade in Libya? And the third sort of question that came in then was, Blocking the escape routes of runaway slaves as done by the Irish Marine. Is this really called a crime in Ireland? And the person says, I can't, I presume it means I can't see the, mar the mariner being prosecuted. Like it's obviously something to do with trade between Libya and here. And what can we do to boycott slave traders? Is, is it clear enough to answer? That's something I I would personally wouldn't be familiar with. Um, JP, do you know anything about that? Um, well, what I, what I would say in response to the, the general sort of um, question that's put out there, um, maybe removing the, the Libyan element from it, I think, you know, we all have a responsibility when we talk about that, that lobbying of government, that we do contact the um, Department of Foreign Affairs to look at supply chains, to look at trade that is taking place between and inter-countries. Um, we can, I guess, feed into the, the reduction of that modern day slavery around the world by being, as Leisha mentioned, that conscious consumer, being that ethical consumer every day of the week. It's not just when you visit that one shop that you pick up one thing that's ethically sourced. Um, so Leisha, you might like to feed into that. Um, yeah, I suppose and this is probably just a reflection of my background. I, would, I wouldn't use the term slave trade i there, there's a lot of conversation around the use of slavery or modern slavery contemporary slavery in relation to um i know it's a broad umbrella term that covers not just trafficking but other related uh, practices such as um uh, servitude or in um uh, yeah forced labor those kinds of things but there's particular sensitivity um, and terms like that should really be retained for the transatlantic slave trade and the uh, and recognition of the the, the the fact that that was quite different to what exists at the moment. That said, to uh, refer to the uh, substance of the question, um, I don't know 
who or how you would boycott my understanding, which I will wholeheartedly admit is limited, um, of the slave markets which have been identified in Libya are that they are around migrants who are being traded within that, that section. And I, I don't know if it's for agriculture, I'm not sure exactly where they're being traded. I believe quite a bit of it is that they are retained um, for ransom from, from, from their, their, their home areas. Um, so I don't, I don't know that there's an actual value chain that you could follow um, into uh, a product to boycott or not. That said, <laughs> there are a number of, uh, well, I suppose this is very, speaking in a very personal capacity, there are a number of brands whose products I do not buy on account of what I am aware of about their uh, treatment of workers. Um, Nestle have long been, um, have, have had a lot of, uh, accusations laid at their feet in relation to different uh, aspects around child labour, in relation to the treatment of women, in relation to union busting, those kinds of things. Um, so I think if you can look into, if, if you have a particular, I suppose, preference, I love chocolate. <laughs> so I try to make sure that the chocolate that I buy is as ethical as possible. Um, I'm, I don't buy a whole lot in the line of clothes and I tend to buy them secondhand anyway. So, but if somebody was, um, and I suppose there's, there's quite a bit to be said about not necessarily boycotting um, some places. I know that activists working on garment production have repeatedly called for, say, whether it's Primark or H&M or whoever was involved in um, Rana Plaza and, and, and other things, not to boycott, rather to, again, to go back to the, the good old letter, to, to write to or send an email to or tweet to um, the, the manufacturers of the garments and state that your preference is that they do not use exploitative labor, maybe pick up on one or two things um, around different accusations that are in the public arena. Um, I know one in relation to garments, one thing that you get time and again is that the, the public demands these cheaper clothes, you know, that the, the market pressure is for the cheaper clothes. So I think if you can say, well, no, I'd be actually, excuse me, I would by far prefer to pay an extra two euros and know that the workers were not exploited, and to know that the environmental protections of the, the, uh, the locations that the garments went through were, were upheld, those kinds of things. So I think that's maybe the, the direction I go. But like I say, I, I certainly do boycott <laughs> the ones that I don't like as well. Okay. Um, I'm not sure whether we're stuck for time or do you want to add one more question if you wish? I think we're pretty tight for time now, Jerry. Um, okay. So um, unless it was a particularly brilliant, insightful question, but oh, okay. then, we'll, then we'll leave it. Um, Listen, um, that conversation, just for the audience to know, that conversation ran longer than we thought it would run. Um, but, uh, you know, thanks a million to Anne, to JP and to Leisha. And, um, and thanks a million for, for such an engaging conversation. Um, you know, like it, it, um, it really made a difference uh, to, to really hear your expertise and, you know, to get a, a real sense of, of what's happening. Um, so I suppose just uh, let you know that there'll be a, a few resources that we'll put into an email and we'll send it out to everybody um, tomorrow or the day after. Um, we'll, we'll include the links for those websites that, that JP mentioned um, and a few other bits and pieces um, about trafficking. So listen, again, I'd like to thank you. Um, I'd like to thank you all. I'd like to thank Anne, JP and Leisha. And also I'd like to thank Jerry Ford the SMA Justice Officer for um, for for keeping an eye on the chat box and for bringing your questions to us. So um, I suppose that leaves me to, to hand back to Sister Janet. Thank you, John. I believe that was insightful, interesting, and a very good conversation. It's a challenge to all of us to see judge and to act. In conclusion, I hope you all found this webinar informative, inspiring and motivating. To draw the curtain on this evening's webinar, I would like to thank 
you are cherished participants for making time to join us. The more people get to know and understand this crime and abuse of fundamental human rights, the more likely we are to spot the signs and hopefully take action both individually and collectively to combat it. Special thanks once again to Lisha Nivrian, Anne Mara and JP O'Sullivan. A big thank you also to Michelle Robertson, OLA communication officer who has been working behind the scenes, managing the technical side for this evening. Gracias to John and Jerry, the justice officers of OLA and SME for planning, organizing, implementing and keeping the conversation going. Not forgetting the support committee of both offices as well. Happy night rest to everyone and God bless. Thank you very much. <laughs>